Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to this video. So we're going to be talking about the composite commodity theorem. So this is attributed to John Hicks in 1936. Um, and what the theorem says, well, it's not really a mathematical theorem, but if a group of prices move in parallel to each other, then the corresponding group of commodities can be viewed as a composite commodity. So if we have, you know, two prices, that being Coke and Pepsi, given by this graph here, and their fluctuations are moved together, we can construct a composite index out of these prices. Um, there are much deeper ways of going and understanding this, but I'm gonna just go and give the explanation of Deaton and Mulbar as discussed in this book here, Economics and Consumer Behavior, and uh, that of Michael Carter in his 1991 paper, which I think are the most basic ways of really going and understanding uh, the material. So for Deaton and Mulbar, um, they go and they use the following. They define P1, P2, and P3 to be prices of three goods at time t. And we're also going to say P2 and P3 go, and their distinguishing uh, time factor is determined by this theta term uh, jointly, right? And we have this P uh, naught, right, with this, which is this zero here at the top here, which is some base uh, period for the price of good I and theta is the portion that varies with time. We note that um, for any period, it follows that the marginal rate of substitution, right, is equal to our price ratio. This just goes and knocks out this time term. So we're going to always be having uh, our optimality conditions unchanged, right? And we can only need to focus on the allocation between P one and x1 and this other composite commodity here so really what this means is that we don't have to analyze uh each one of these goods individually right we can just go and focus on their composite index instead so carter in his 1991 paper he considers these preferences more directly right so this really lies on the fact that um we need to go and keep these optimality conditions uh, unchanged, right? So we have to go and have some sort of separability of preferences as well. That's just, you know, my guess over here. And he says that by going and solving for this maximum of P naught, we're also solving for the maximum of these two problems down here, meaning that we're maximizing uh, with respect to u of one and plus this v term which embodies our composite uh utility and p2 here which is only focusing on the allocation of these goods in our composite index so we can really go and solve for a lot of information so the way we prove this is by letting um x star be equal to x1 x2 and x3 and x hat be equal to x1 hat x2 hat and x3 hat and those are going to be the solution to P naught, right? That being with reference to our X star and P1 and P2 respectively, this being with reference to our X hat. Now we have to note that these optimums must solve our first order conditions of P naught and P1 and P2 respectively. So let's go and note some of the key first order conditions that we're going to be using. So we have our first order conditions for P naught, right? I didn't list all of them here and P1 and P2. Since we're living in the world of maximums, we note that delta is gonna be equal to mu here, meaning that we are going to go and have that these two conditions up here, they're going to be the same, right? And we're also going to sub this result from P2 of three, right? And we're gonna go and plug that into this guy here. Once we do that, we get the same sort of first order conditions as we get in our original problem here. So this just goes and shows that we just need to focus on the allocation between X1 and X bar, right? We don't need to focus on all the details of X bar. We just need to focus on the allocation of that composite commodity there. So in terms of going and uh, thinking about this from a graphical perspective, a perspective that is readily accessible to anyone with an intermediate microeconomics education. Um, we have this two-sided graph. Um, we have 
x1 on the x-axis here, right, on the right-hand side, with a x-bar being our composite index at the top. Um, if we were to go and see, say, a increase, right, or a fall in both these prices of x2 and x3, because remember, um, these prices are, you know, they move in parallel to each other. So we're going to go and only see uh, this up and down sort of motion, as in we can only see this sort of parallel motion here we should end up going and seeing right let's go pick a little bit of a different color let's pick a light green here we should go and see something along this line here it's just a matter of connecting your dots uh here and we get a another allocation right right here as well as some allocation that is given right here so all this is saying is that we can go and think about the allocation between x1 and x bar and x2 and x3 completely separately from each other now i just want to go and iterate this if it hasn't been clear already that the composite commodity theorem demonstrates that how we can use a index or economic aggregates as a stand-in for cleaner data and still be able to solve important problems in consumer theory. This is particularly important when deriving demand equations in an environment where we don't have specific data. It also gives guidelines for proper aggregation, that this being with reference to prices moving in parallel to each other, because you wouldn't necessarily have uh, the same sort of optimality conditions uh, involved there. So um, this is an overview on, I guess, a overlooked uh, theorem uh, in economics called the composite commodity theorem. I hope this helps. Take care.